True Digital Media Consulting. You're online right now and so are your customers, but marketing has to be a consistent journey. True Digital Media Consulting can help with your online ads, organic growth, and so much more. Contact us today at 832-934-4436 or visit our website at truedigitalmediaconsulting.com. Looking to advertise? Join the Sphere's vast demographic reach of thousands of people all over the world. Send an email today to advertise at thesphere.tv or call us at area code 832-772-7789. KOG and Company. Are your unique gifts and talents changing the world? Do you desire to belong to a community of unity? Visit kogpassion.com to learn more about the Unleash Your Dopeness movement. All right, welcome back everybody to the Docs Podcast. We're excited to have you back. I'm excited to be back. I've been gone for a while. Uh, Dr. Davis, Keisha, Dr. Pinckney, and Dr. Batiste have been holding it down, doing a great job, and I'm excited to be back with you guys. Of course, our goal and objective is to educate, empower, and inspire you guys. We have another great show up uh, for you guys today. We're going to be chatting about uh, the opioid epidemic, which is uh, a pertinent topic, something that's near and dear to me uh, as a pain physician, something that I see on a daily basis. And I have a guest with me today that I'm super excited about that also is very knowledgeable in this topic. One of my best friends from medical school, Dr. Krishna Shah. So I'm going to kick it over to him to introduce himself, tell him a little bit about you, tell him a little bit about himself, where he's from, and uh, we'll go from there and get started. All right. Well, uh, thank you first for having me. Absolutely. Super, super happy to be here. A um, little bit about myself. I'm an anesthesiologist and interventional pain physician. Um, my career started a long time ago. I was I did my undergraduate study at uh, in California at Berkeley. I had a short stint in the finance and business world working for a, a consulting firm uh, and then decided I had a, wanted to get into medicine. So I went on to medical school at uh, UT Houston, stayed around at Baylor College of Medicine to complete my anesthesiology residency. Um, then I went over to Boston at the Harvard program to um, specialize in interventional pain. And uh, now I'm back here in Houston. So um, I'm practicing uh, as an anesthesiologist and uh, interventional pain physician. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to have you. Um, we were just chatting on the way over here. Um, it's kind of crazy how full circle things have come. Like we literally met each other uh, the weekend before medical school started at our little retreat that our school does and, and just became really fast friends. And our careers have sort of taken the exact same trajectory, actually. Both did anesthesiology residency and then both did pain fellowships and are both now practicing uh, pain physicians here in Houston. So it's fun to kind of share our journey and, and chat about um, how far we've come. Um, before we get into the topic of the opioid epidemic, where our hot topic kind of deals with that. Um, so the hot topic for today is that, um, and I'm sure it's on many major outlets, but on CNN.com in the health section, um, there's a recent article today, actually, that there is a lawsuit that has been, um, I guess, reopened against Purdue Pharma by the state of Massachusetts, alleging that they essentially had an aim to um, become this end-to-end -end pain provider. Purdue Pharma is a major manufacturer of OxyContin and, and, and that opioid medication and some of its uh, um, uh, reversal agents as well. And so this lawsuit is essentially alleging that the, the makers of this drug, some of the people in high ranking positions really knew the potential, you know, addictive nature of this medication and, and were really trying to push uh, prescribing on doctors and prescribing on to patients and and to some degree they this article has sort of sensationalized a little bit but almost blamed them for this current opioid epidemic that we have uh, curious as to what your thoughts are about that yeah it was, a, it was a really good article and and uh, it is the article I felt like was doing that it was sort of putting putting a lot of blame on the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company and sort of the industry um, and uh, yeah, you know, they should have some blame. Um, but, you know, I recognize that any um, 
pharmaceutical company or any company in particular, they want to generate revenues, they want to want to generate profit. Yeah. And um, that's where it comes down to physicians to really say, hey, you know, is this right for the patient? Is right. it in the best interest of the patient? And let's do our due diligence before we um, uh, prescribe to a uh, medication, a procedure, or an intervention. Right. Um, or anything of that matter. Yeah. I think the, the sort of the opposite end of that spectrum, and, and, and we were chatting about this on the way over here as well, is a big part of what we do in addition to medications is procedures. Mm-hmm. And a um, couple of months ago, uh, we did a show sort of um, delving a little bit deeper into this documentary that at the time was new on Netflix that was going into sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly of the medical device industry in sort of talking about how there are devices or device companies that um, are maybe not undergoing the most rigorous testing in terms of making sure that, you know, the devices that they're producing are up to standard or meeting rigorous standards. So I agree. I think it's the same thing with, um, with the medications as it is with procedures and with devices that we may implant or use for patients is really – that the responsibility is, is not only on the manufacturer, but on the physician as well to understand the, the ins and outs of the device or the procedure and really make sure that what they're recommending is something that is, you know, up to whatever the current standards are. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it, it you know, it can be very hard for, for physicians as well because you have, you can't have pharmaceuticals, you can't have industry putting a lot of pressure on physicians. And so it becomes, um, important physicians to sort of stay blinded from those things and really push forward in saying what's best for the patient away from anything else Yeah, and then making a plan from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of going ahead and, and, and moving forward to really sort of get down into the topic of the opioid epidemic itself, we sort of have segued in by, you know, talking about that article um, and then um, talking about the device industry as well. But um, the CDC, which is uh, kind of my go-to resource for statistics because they obviously keep a lot of um, a close eye on, on these types of issues. They have a lot of good data regarding drug overdoses in general, but overdoses related to uh, pain medications, whether they be you know synthetic medications that people are getting and using off the street, or if they are prescription pain medications that folks are getting from a physician. So just a couple of these numbers. In 2017, there were over 70,000 deaths related to drug overdose. Uh, Of those 70,000 opioids, and this is sort of opioids together, whether they're opioids that are synthetic and off the street or opioids that are prescription opioids, uh, were involved in almost 48,000, so almost 70%, 68% of those deaths. Some of the states that they identified that had the highest rates of overdose were West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Um, the District of Columbia, Ohio, um, and then on a daily basis, and this is sort of what hit home for me, and and I'm curious for you, Dr. Dr. Shah, 46 people died daily from prescription opioid overdose. So meaning they go to their primary care physician, they go to their pain physician, and medications that they are prescribed on a regular basis, you know, kind of rounding up, 50 people are dying daily. Um, Some of the most common drugs involved are methadone, uh, oxycodone, and hydrocodone. Um, So just sort of before we get into some of those questions, um, what are some of your thoughts on those statistics? The two things took out to me. Uh The 70,000 deaths in a year. Yeah. So I just did some quick math here. And you 70,000 deaths in a year Mm -hmm. in 365 days, it's almost 200 deaths Per day, it's crazy. And then you take it a step further, and you said forty-six people die from prescription medications. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the other about another hundred and fifty are non-prescription medications. Yeah. Question is, where did that start from? Yeah. Where did it, I, I would love to know the stat of of the hundred and fifty people per day. Mm-hmm. How many of them were started on prescription opioids, right. and then transitioned because they couldn't get medications anymore? Right. Transitioned into so what was like the gateway or exactly. The, the exactly. entry point from, was it something, was it a behavior that existed prior to getting prescription medications? Was this something that developed as a result of mm-hmm. getting medications and being on? That's an excellent question. I've never yeah. actually thought about it that way. And it's, it's significant. Yeah. It's a significant amount of people. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to 
you know, what can we do now to sort of limit limit these prescriptions that we're writing definitely to sort of decrease this amount of deaths every day. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, you and I both see it every day, you know, folks that come in to our clinics and, um, you know, maybe have a preconceived idea of what, what kind of care they're going to be getting and what's going to be offered. And so I'm going to kind of shout out our first sponsor because we love our sponsors here and then we're going to get more into that. Um, this first portion of the show is sponsored by True Digital. You're online right now and so are your customers. The question is, how do you actively reach them? Marketing has to be a consistent journey and we're here to walk with you every step of the way. True Digital Media Consulting can help with website development, online ads, your business reputation, and organic growth on search engines. Give us a call today to discuss a customized strategy for your business at 832 834-4436 934-4436 or send us an email to info at truedigitalmediaconsulting.com. Mention the sphere to receive a free 30-minute strategy consultation. Um, shout out to True Digital. We appreciate you um, sponsoring this portion of the show. Um, so sort of getting back back into the discussion, um, you know, you and I had this sort of you know, just off the cuff discussion the other day about what do people think about pain physicians? And I think that that question or that thought is evolving as more and more people are aware of the dangers that come with these medications and and addiction and, and abuse and withdrawal. So what are your thoughts about when, when patients come in to see you, what are their general notions about what you are as a pain physician or what you do? So that, that's a great question <laughs> because I think a lot of people don't really know, don't really know what yeah, I do I agree. on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, you know, historically interventional pain or just pain medicine, the specialty yeah. hasn't been around that long. Right. It's been around for, it really started picking up steam in the late eighties, early nineties. Right. So think about it, maybe 25, 30 years of a, of a specialty. Um, and historically those first 15 years when we were treating pain, what do we typically do? Give medications. Right. We had these medications that we were told based on studies that this is the right way to treat patients on, right. on with pain medications, the opioids and oxycodones and oxycontin. Right. And over the last 10 or 15 years, it's been, a in, incredible advances in, in pain medicine and the specialty in terms of other things we can do. Yeah. That are not just medications, right? But the challenge is with patients and 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 even um, uh, just a general public and yeah. my colleagues, other other physicians in mm-hmm. different specialties, mm-hmm. is um, explain and understanding. You know what else? Do, what else can I provide other right. than medications? And that's interventions and procedures and right. how to sort of decrease pain and sort of other than medications. Right. Um, but to answer your question, um, yeah. Patients would really just think you come into, or people just think you come to a pain clinic to get your meds. Get your meds. Get yeah. your meds refilled. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I I, I completely agree with everything you said. Is um, is and 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 we chatted about this the other day. Where it's like when people ask me what I do, I almost cringe a little bit when I tell them I'm a pain physician, because I feel like when I say that there are there's already some ideas about who I am and what I do. Oh, you're this sleazy guy who just writes medications and you're probably getting a kickback from the companies and making all this extra money from the companies, which is like, that's not the case. Now, unfortunately, I think that reputation has developed because there were, and maybe there still are some folks out there who are maybe not practicing, you know, up to standard like you or I would consider, um, and are maybe taking advantage of just writing medications and, and not really trying to do a thorough, comprehensive approach. Um, but I think you're right. I think one of the most challenging things is to is is challenging the the thought out there about what we are from both patients and our colleagues who are going to be referring us or, or giving recommendations or telling patients what to expect before they even come to us. So that's that's <clears throat> and that's exactly it. And that's one of the reasons why I went into pain medicine in yeah. the first place. Yeah, because there are there are so many things that we can do. And a lot of it starts with education. So if we can explain to patients that, hey, I can help with your low back pain or your right. neck pain. 
and we don't have to have you all these medications and opioids. Mm-hmm. Um, let's try to let's try to work together and, and have a comprehensive approach. Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, sort of thinking back to to you know getting into fellowship and getting into training. I think w- one question that I got on the interview trail, and I'm sure you got it too, is because this opioid epidemic thing has sort of been been brewing. Um, one question I got a lot was what do I think was contributing to the opioid epidemic? And I'm curious as to what you think. And if you want to hear the answers to these questions, people on Facebook live, you're going to have to tune in to the rest of the podcast. Thank you so much for those of you who have been tuning in on Facebook live. Um, we ask that you subscribe to our show on all the major platforms, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Google play and Stitcher. Review our show on iTunes with conservative, uh, constructive, excuse me, feedback. Share this Facebook Live post an entire show with your family and friends. And if you are so inclined, please, please donate to our mission to bring enhanced, enriched, and inspiring content each and every week. You can donate at www.thesphere.tv slash donate. Um, shout out to everybody who's been tuning in on Facebook Live. I hope to see you on the rest of the podcast. Um, so, yeah, sort of getting into that question in your mind what do you think are or is the major contributor to how we got to where we are today where we have this huge problem yeah that's a good question i to start i I would say it's just a lack of education and lack of understanding that we had Mm -hmm. when a lot of these medications the opioids are coming out yeah um and not saying that anyone did anything wrong anything wrong it's just we just didn't know what five, 10, 15 year of being on these medications and sure. what would happen. Yep. Um, and we, the, the treatment algorithm that we had was, if you have pain, give medication. Pain comes back, give more medication. Mm-hmm. And so we kept doing that. And uh, we got to a point now where it's like, we realized that that wasn't the right sure. approach. Right. And so what we know now is 180 degrees different than what we knew 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And now we're just learning this over the last two or three years and why you're starting to see even just the term opioid epidemic, you start right. seeing the CDC really get involved and really practitioners. And I've, and I've noticed it in my own practice and mm-hmm. I've noticed it amongst my colleagues that everyone's really, in our gener- in my generation, our generation, that mm-hmm. folks are really more cautious about, all right, who is the right candidate for opioids? Right. Because don't get me wrong, I, I think opioids are a wonderful medication. They're Absolutely. a great medication. Yeah. If they're prescribed um, appropriately right. um, for the right patient. And right. so we're learning that now after 15 years of data and 15, yeah. 20 years of data. And so um, I think it just started from not really knowing yeah. and not having the right education at that time. Yeah. I, I mean, I think if, if there's anything or that you take home is just is education really from this. And I, I, I agree. I think for me, when I think about, you know, that question, and I think the way I sort of answered it at that time, going through the interview trail and, and, and getting this question asked multiple times is, or was, excuse me, um, I, I think to some degree when, when pain became this fifth vital sign and became sort of this marker for, you know, hospitals meeting certain patient satisfaction or patient experience quotas and and hospitals being sort of judged positively or negatively on that i think to some degree even though i think the intent was was good i think that this led to this sort of culture of over prescribing and any pain is bad and if if there is any pain at all we need to you know, we got to be on hydrocodone. If hydrocodone doesn't work, we got to try morphine and then oxycodone. And so it led to this culture where because of how now vital pain became as a vital sign, it was, okay, if if there's pain, if the pain's greater than a six or greater than an eight, then we've got to do these, you know, heroic measures to make sure that we get patients down to this sort of arbitrary number of less than five or four, right? Which... And that's one thing I've always like sort of had a bone to pick, if you will, if there's any, if I could say that with like pain in general is, is this number scale, right? So you could take 10 people in a room and, and, and they have the same injury or ailment and you ask them on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain at all, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had in your life. What number is your pain right now? And you may get 10 different answers, even though it's the same injury, same mechanism, same threshold or should be the same sort of 
pain generation. There's so much variation in that number. So I think we got so, so, you know, hyper almost about treating this number and making sure that we got this number down without thinking about what that potentially did long term, you know? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think you, you hit it on the point by by creating pain as a fifth vital sign mm-hmm. and creating this as a metric. Yeah. And exactly, we have to figure out a way to do some homework move to decrease that number right. to meet your metric. Right. But pain, or especially chronic pain, is there's no quick fix. Right. There's no quick fix to give oh, a medication man. or yep. do something that will make it go away in a couple hours. Right. And I think um, that's a challenging thing for physicians, physicians and a challenging thing for patients as mm-hmm. well that mm-hmm. – to help with chronic pain, it's going to take some time. Yeah. And that's where people like me and you come in. We're yeah. specialized in this. And we say, hey, we can work on a comprehensive, comprehensive approach and figure out different sort of modalities to help you. Yeah. But it's not going to be a quick fix. Yeah. You, you bring up a good thought to my mind that I'm going to, uh, you know, piggyback on once I shout out the Sphere, who has sponsored this particular portion of the show. Um, Are you starting your business and looking for a place to advertise? Do you have a need to reach out to thousands of people across the world to build your brand or sell your product? If so, get your product placement and advertising needs handled right here at the Sphere. We offer a wide variety of content delivery platforms, including iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Stitcher. Plus, we have a vast demographic reach within the United States as well as modern countries across the globe. Our enriched content and inspiring dialogue, coupled with your strategic ad, is surely to hit the mark every time. Call us today at area code 832-772-7789 or send an email over to advertise at thesphere.tv. Shout out to The Sphere, of course. Um, Man, you said something that just made me really think um, about about sort of m- my practice and sort of my approach. And sometimes it's hard, right? When somebody comes to you or is sent to you by someone else and they say, go to Dr. Shah or go to Dr. Oswagu, they're going to do X, Y, and Z or they'll prescribe X, Y, and Z for you, right? It's almost like there's a little bit of pressure, like I need to do something, Right. I need to write a new medication. I need to do a procedure. I need to do something because that is the expectation that this patient or their provider who sent them to me has. And it's almost like you sometimes have to take a step back and be like, like you said, sometimes the best thing to do is is nothing and just give time for whatever process is occurring to heal naturally or wait and reassess and do some other things. So there's almost... And I think it sort of has a little bit to do with just just being type A as a physician and wanting to be a control and wanting to have answers and wanting to fix things where you have to reel yourself back sometimes and be like, I don't always have to do something. And that can be – I know that's challenging for me. I don't know if you have the same issues from time it, to time. It's it's very challenging, especially when they come from a referring provider and they have – they're on a slew a very large amount of opioids or yep. a large amount of medications and just try to work with the patient to see what else can we do yeah. to continue these is okay, but right. how do we sort of wean them off and how, how do we sort of try other things? And it's challenging. Yeah, definitely. So that, that sort of leads into my next question for you, which is when you do get a, a new patient to your office that is sent to you from a uh, you know, referring physician, um, Again, honestly, sometimes with the expectation that, oh, I don't write these meds anymore, but Dr. Shah will write these medications for you. What is your approach to that patient that has been on chronic opioid therapy for their low back pain or their shoulder pain? How do you approach that patient? Yeah, that's a great question. So, number one, I listen. Yeah. I want, I want to know and I really want to hear from the patient. Yeah, that's key. Sort of, when did this pain start? Tell me about it. And how has it sort of changed over the last six months or year or years? And I want to know how has it affected your life? How is it, where is it located? How is it changing? And that sort of helps me process sort of what is really going on, Mm -hmm. ultimately to really figure out what's the cause of this pain. Yeah. I figure if we, it goes back to education. If I'm able to educate myself on the patient and educate myself on where is this pain coming from, then I'm better able to treat them. Yeah. Um, that's and like good. I and like I said before, I don't mind opioids. Opioids are are good medication when they're for the right patient, with the right indication. Right. But if they're not for the right 
um, if it's not if it's not prescri- if it's not for the right indication, yeah, then let's figure out why we're having this pain. Let's try to work together to figure out what we right. can do. Dude, that's good. Um, that's so good because I think I think the in, the initial thing right for all physicians, not just pain physicians, but for all physicians, is listening and observing. There's so much rich information that comes from listening to your patient and observing your patient, especially for us, because I think the other thing too with pain in this, cause, and, and I know you've gotten this and I've gotten it too, where you get patients that come to the office who have been on opioids for a long time and maybe have never tried anything else. They've never done physical therapy. They've never done yoga or stretching. They've never had injections, right? I think the other thing that's key for us to pick up, especially in how pain is defined, right? I think when people think about, like if you ask somebody, how do you define pain, right? Oh, well, pain is when you, you know, get in an accident or you roll your ankle and your ankle hurts, right? We know that pain is more than just a physical manifestation of an injury, right? Pain is, you know, uh, unpleasant sensory or emotional experience due to actual perceived, that formal definition, right? I think the key thing in that is that it's an emotional experience too, right? So like you said, how has this affected your activities of daily living? How has this potentially impacted your job? How has this impacted your family, right? Because when you ask those questions and you listen and you take the time, you may find out like there's more to this than just, you know, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so has had a bad knee. This is... They got a bad knee and so they can't work anymore. So they're not providing for their family. So they're anxious and they're stressed or they're depressed. Have those issues been addressed and properly taken care of? And I want to get your more thoughts on that um, in just a second. Um, Definitely want to shout out our final sponsor. Of course, this particular portion of the show is sponsored by KOG and Company. Are your unique gifts and talents changing the world? Unleash Your Dopeness is a people empowerment movement built to encourage the masses to operate outside of their fears and have the gall to recklessly pursue their dreams and passions in life. Join thousands of others as we unlock the greatness that dwells inside. Shop dope gear at kogpassion.com. That's kogpassion.com and use coupon code DOPE for 10% off exclusive Unleash Your Dopeness apparel. Act now. Sizes are selling out fast. Um... Shout out to KOG, of course, and shout out to all the sponsors. We really appreciate you. Um, I found for me, like in in these you know few short months of practicing after finishing all the training, that some of my richest experiences and and and, and don't get me wrong, I love doing the procedures and, and restoring function from doing procedures. Um, but some of my richest experiences have come from talking to folks and and sort of getting below the surface of, oh, I've got a bad knee or I've got a bad back and getting into how that really deeply affects them and offering them therapy. Maybe nobody's offered them to talk to a psychologist to say, hey, you just may need to unload on somebody to talk about how this has affected you. Curious as to what your thoughts yeah. on that you know, are pain, well. pain is such an interesting, such an interesting specialty and such an interesting field because yeah. You're right. It's it's you roll your ankle and it hurts. That of course that's pain. Right. But stress is pain. Yeah. You know, there's a whole emotional component of pain. Hundred percent. And there's a whole physical component of pain. Yeah. And um you know, just listening and so I I any patient I, that comes in to see me, I I spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. Um that initial encounter I spend a lot of time really just trying to understand mm-hmm. them. What do they do for work? What do they who do they live with, and just get a better idea yeah. of e- to educate myself about them. Yeah. Um, because you're right, there's a lot of things that go on, mm-hmm. um, and it comes back to opioids. Yeah. Right. And so, are opioids good for emotional pain? Are opioids good for physical pain? And so, mm-hmm. how much is enough? How much is not enough? Yeah. And and um, there's no cookie cutter answer. Right. Like, there's no algorithm you can put for a mm-hmm. pain patient and say this patient needs this type of opioid and yeah. and this type of injection and right. this type of, every single patient is different. hundred percent. And um, that's something I find so interesting about pain is yeah. that two patients come in with back pain and they're going to have two complete different mm-hmm. treatment algorithms right? because 
there's two different there's so many different types of pain right exactly and i, I think um man i hit the nail on the head again where y- y- you know there's there's no protocol okay this is my back pain protocol or this is my knee pain protocol or this is my shoulder pain protocol it's it's individualized based on what that particular patient needs and i think i think one thing that i i try to you know educate my patients on is 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 what our goals are right so part of my visits are obviously gleaning and listening as much getting as much information as possible about you know tell me how long you've had this pain where does it hurt how long does it last those types of questions and then also finding out okay what what is it that you can't do now that you want to do or you miss doing and how can we work towards that because you know you and I were chatting on the way over here that you know so many times I'll, I'll get somebody to come in and, and part of asking and, and getting all this information is you know tell me what your pain feels like right and more often than not, not always, but a lot of times the answer I get is, oh, it's an eight. And I'm like, okay, well, I want to know. I don't want to know a number. I want you to tell me actually what it, what sensation are you getting? Is it a throbbing? Is it a burning? Is it a shooting? Does it stay in one place? Are there things that make it worse? So it's it's almost like you said, you're right. It's almost like we have this like, over the years of this n- opioid epidemic now, we've created this culture almost, this pain culture, where the pain is a number, right? And and the goal is to decrease that number without regard for what that means in the context of what are you actually able to do, right? You know, you may have a zero, but you are sitting on the couch all day because you're so sleepy and drowsy because you're taking medications every two, three hours, right? But if you, let's say you start at a 10 and we're able to work you down to a a six and you can, you know, go to work and you can spend time with your family on the weekends and you can go to the kids' soccer games, like that is much better to me than you being a zero and being non-functional essentially. So I think you're right. It's, It's so hard to almost, changing the way people think about something is so hard. And I think that's the, one of the most important things that you and I do, you know? Yeah. And you know, something you just said is changing, changing the way people think is hard. Yeah. And, and that's why over the last, you know, few years with these new CDC guidelines that are Mm -hmm. out, um, on prescribing opioids. Right. Um, and trying to explain that and, and educate patients. Yeah. That hey, these are the new guidelines that are out. Right. This is why we have them. Right. Um, is having to change the way patients think. Yeah. Because I, you know, I get a lot, and patients tell me, um, I've been on this, I've been on this regimen for fifteen years. Right. This is what I do. That's what I do. And so, I'm not saying that's wrong. Yeah. But I'm saying that if it's not going back to goals, if it's mm-hmm. not improving, if it's not finding a right. A, positive improvement you know each visit right then i'm here to work with you yeah and i'm here and we're going to have a comprehensive approach and and um let's try to work together and make you feel a little better definitely um so it's interesting yeah yeah so that that sort of begs the question then i think again sort of you know destigmatizing you know pain physicians right in terms of oh these are just guys that are writing a bunch of prescriptions and never seeing patients and making all this money blah 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 whatever in addition to medications, whether it be opioids or, or non-narcotic pain medications, what are other things that you offer your patients that could potentially decrease or even eliminate the need for these medications? Yeah. So really important for any patient is physical therapy. Yeah. And I know a lot of um, some folks may not like to hear that so much, mm-hmm. but physical therapy works really well. Yeah. You really work on your core strengthening, your legs, your abs, your back. Right. It really does wonders in sort of helping your pain. Um, and then we start thinking about interventions. And yeah. so it goes back to what I was saying. There's there's no quick fix for, for pain. Sure. Um, and so interventions are – what are interventions? So interventions are – Injections or mm-hmm. steroid injections or the the layman's term people always hear is a cortisone shot. Right, right. And so 
I was expl- explaining folks, why do we do a cortisone shot? What's mm-hmm. the real the purpose for that? Yeah. I know that it's not going to last forever. Sure. So why do you do these things? Right. Well, I do these things because I want to give you six weeks, two months, three months of relief. Right. And so when you have those six or six weeks or two months, three months of relief, that's the time where I want you to really focus on your physical therapy. Absolutely. Really w- focus on your core strengthening. Mm-hmm. Because when that medication wears off, then you're already stronger. Right. Because you did that stuff during that time. Right. So you won't have, be in as much pain when that medication does wear off. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we if you have low back pain, there's there's injections into the spine, mm-hmm. um, and there's and there's neck pain. The injections we do sort of in the cervical area, your, right. your neck region. Um, and so, when we evaluate someone, we sort of figure out where is exactly it coming from. Yeah, and then we sort of target that nerve and target that location. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and. Um yeah, I agree. I'm the same way. I think um, the key is just educating. My job, I feel like, is to educate myself on each patient when I meet them. And and based on what I get in the history that I'm able to take, the physical exam, you know, any diagnostic imaging um, that I may have at my disposal, then come up with the best sort of plan of attack. And it never involves just medications or just injections or just therapy. It's, it's sort of a combination of those modalities and sort of the, the breakdown of how much medications, how much therapy, how much procedures is different for each person. But I think the ultimate goal, like you stated, is, um, you know, to do our best to decrease the pain enough to where people are able to function and have a quality of life that allows them to participate in therapy, which may help them continue to get better and may actually provide longer lasting relief than just popping pills all day. Um, and then also just to, again, just enjoy family, friends, and, and all that life would have to offer them if they you know, weren't having issues. You know. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And another question I get a lot often yeah. is do I need surgery? Is surgery going to fix this? For yeah. me? Is surgery going to fix my pain? Yeah. Um, and like I said, every patient is different. Yeah. And so, you know, if I, if I always evaluate the patient and think, Hey, yeah, they need to see a surgeon because mm-hmm. it's progressing. Right. Um, but what's interesting also is I also see a lot of patients who already had surgery mm-hmm. and then I see them two, three years later after they had any sort of spine surgery and they right. have this back pain or neck pain again. Yeah. And what do we do for these patients? Yeah. And um, the, the specialty of pain medicine has changed so much, like I mentioned before, yeah. that 20 years ago we had pills and medications right. and do that. Now we got injections and procedures. And right. now we have this whole new world of neuromodulation. Yeah. yeah. And people ask, what is neuromodulation? Yeah. And so it's actually been around for a long time. No one really has been doing it. Right. Over the last four or five years, the... Um, the technology has changed so yeah. much where neuromodulation is we place these catheters or what we call electrodes in right. someone's yep. back mm-hmm. and uh, we provide this sort of uh, in electrical impulses essentially to the spinal cord right. and it blocks pain pathways. Yeah. And this is a, a long-term treatment option that we right. that I can offer to patients, um, yeah. that we both offer to patients. Yeah. Um, again, if we select the patient correctly, right. the treatment modality is great. Absolutely. And so going back to your question about what else can we do besides medications? It's right. let's start from the least in, least invasive sort of treatment option. Right. So non-opioid medications mm-hmm. and some basic procedures or injections. Yeah. And then let's work our way up to are you a candidate for some of these more advanced stuff to give you long-term Absolutely. relief. Absolutely. Um, all while also doing physical therapy, right. also while doing some medications. And right. And again, having this comprehensive approach. But Absolutely. The specialty has changed so much in the last five years. That yeah. It's, exci- it's an exciting time to be in it. Yeah. Um, and uh, some of the challenges are really educating patients and really educating them on, hey, we have these options. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I agree. And I think, I think too, there's like, you started to bring up, you know, patients ask you, do I need surgery or blah, blah, blah. Um, I think there's also in that um, there is shared responsibility between us as the providers and the patients, right? Meaning, what I mean by that is, I'm obviously going to offer and do everything I think is necessary for the patient to, again, restore their function, decrease their pain. 
And I, I tell people too, I said, you know, this is a partnership. We got to work together, right? So if you've got knee pain, right? And, or you've got low back pain, right? And, and we're, we're not exercising, we're not eating right. We're, we're, we're basically doing all the, the things that are modifiable. You're not modifying those things, right? Exercising a little bit better, eating healthier. And it's, it's hard for all of us, myself included. Um, but there's got to be shared responsibility to, hey, you know what? I really do. I need to get to physical therapy. And I, and I will do an injection if it's indicated to decrease your pain so where you can get to physical therapy and get moving and, and strengthen the low back, strengthen your core, do range of motion exercises, all that. Um, and then if needed, like you said, some of these more advanced therapies. And it's, it's almost like it really is almost like you're opening up a whole new world for patients, right? Because they, their idea again, and that goes back to this sort of what the per general perception is, is I go to a pain doctor to get pain meds, right? I don't go to a pain doctor to get a steroid injection or to get a device implanted where they can put these leads into my epidural space. That's going to interrupt the pain signals. That's like, that's like a whole new world for patients and even for some providers when like you tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm trained as an interventional person as well. It's not just, it's not one or the other. Right. Um, so I agree. I think it's, um, man, an exciting time to, to be in, pain medicine and, and doing what we sort of can on the front lines to, you know, combat the opioid epidemic again, not depriving people who need them and have a clear indication for them. Um, and then it's always just, you know, I, I still wake up and I'm like, it's, it's unbelievable that we get to be doctors and to take care of people in what's a really vulnerable time for them, both in the world of anesthesia, when we're meeting people very quickly before they go to surgery, and in a time of, of, of pain when we see people in our clinics when there's physical and emotional pain. It's um, a privilege to, to sort of, you know, get to peek into so many people's lives and hopefully make a difference and um, improve function. So um, any last parting words before we peace out? No, I'm I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, it was Glad great. You came you know, in. I, I think uh, I think it's an interesting topic. The opioid epidemic is, you know, we all hear on the news. It, it, it's real. Yeah, and it's here. And and uh, to have seventy thousand deaths in a year and to about two hundred yeah. per day, um, it's real. It's a big and, deal. And it's not just from um, heroin and things like that. Yeah. It's from pres- prescribed medications. Yeah. So fifty per day, fifty right. deaths per day. Right. And so it's real. And so, you know, one of the reasons I went into the specialty, it's it's I recognize pain is a real thing. Yeah. And um it's a it's a challenge and it, it it's exciting to work, exciting to work with patients. Yeah, definitely. Um where can the people find you on Instagram and, and your practice location if they're around your area? Yeah, my uh Instagram is uh D Dr. K B Shaw, D R K B S H A H. And um I practice in Pearland is where my uh, uh, interventional pain uh, clinic is. And uh, my website is KrishnashawMD.com. Awesome. Man, appreciate you. This is dope. Yeah. Getting to kind of sit down and chat. Um, Ten years later. And Ten years later. Isn't here. that crazy? Can you believe that? Yeah. Unbelievable. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening. Hopefully you learned something and um, we educated you a little bit today. Thanks to guys for so much who are subscribing and tuning in weekly. Keep tuning in. Um, another great show coming up next week on racial disparities, I believe, in healthcare. Dr. Davis is doing that one. So thanks again for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's cool. That's dope. <laughs> Good job, man. That's awesome.